The next presentation is titled Building the Amazon of Sri Lanka and uh, Entrepreneurship. This will be covered by Lahiru Patmalal, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Takas.lk. He has a BA in Political Science from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and also a Master's in International Relations from University of Queensland, and has worked in the United States, Afghanistan, and also Australia. Prior to co-founding Takas, Lahiru was working in policy and advocacy and his research is published as well. So, people, can we please put our hands together for the CEO and co-founder of Takas.lk on the Takas scale, I'll put it then for Mr. Lahiru Patmalal. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about um, entrepreneurship and um, building the so-called Amazon of Sri Lanka, which is takas.lk. A uh, big thank you to the band for pumping everybody up. And uh, after talking about things like artificial intelligence and um, a, um, um, other cool, cool stuff, I'm going to talk about something a little bit uh, old school, which is um, e-commerce. Can I get a raise of hands and see how many people have bought anything online in Sri Lanka with this group? Anybody? We okay, have good 20, 20, 30 percent, which is good, which means the market is big. So a little bit on what Takas.lk does and what e-commerce companies do in Sri Lanka. So the big thing we are trying to do is essentially to try to solve a problem which somebody has. And by solving that problem, we are hoping to make some money out of it. Uh, Amazon does it. Um, Alibaba does it. Um, all our competitors do that. And the ones who end up winning this game are essentially the guys who do this job very well. And for that, we need technology, we need uh, human, human beings just like you and I uh, to run the ship. Okay, so this is the second slide. This shows essentially what one of the main problems in Sri Lanka is. Sri Lanka is one of the least urbanized countries in the world, which means that population is spread across this big spectrum. So as you can see, all the big boys are in the Western province, but you can see a lot of people in Sri Lanka don't have ready access to products. So I think before we even started Takas, a lot of people were buying products on things like Alibaba, eBay, uh, way before. And what the local entrants have done, essentially, is to try to deliver products to you much quicker. And this is the main problem, essentially, we are solving. Uh, these are some stats for you about how... Um, uh, the welfare of Sri Lankans, I think in the last song they were talking about how Sri Lankans try to uh, jump outside the country for better, greener pastures. But essentially, uh, in Sri Lanka there's 1.3 million households, uh, that's a big number, you have to multiply that by four, uh, which is either the global elites or the ones who have um, quite a lot of disposable income. And I think everybody in this stage right now falls in either the... Uh, 200,000 people who have a lot of money or essentially the ones who buy for convenience or what you would call seekers. So everybody in this, in this hall, they are seekers. They are our customer base. Global retail trends. Uh, does anybody know what's happening uh, because of Amazon and so on and so forth in the West, mainly in the US? Any, any, any shout outs? So essentially what's happening in the US is most of the bigger stores and so on and so forth are essentially closing down. Uh, the primary reason for this is e-commerce is taking around 10% of their business year on year. The reason I'm also telling you this is, as aspiring people who wish to kind of work in the Sri Lankan ecosystem, this is something quite paramount. So when you guys go up into the job field and so on and so forth, look to the future in terms of giving your energy, uh, giving your time and so on and so forth. You would really want to be working for companies who's going to make wealth in Sri Lanka, not the ones which are going to go down. So what's then kind of essentially looking like for Sri Lanka after this? Sorry. So this is essentially another bit of stats. I'll go through the boring stuff before talking about entrepreneurship. Sri Lanka's retail industry, that includes e-commerce as well as your mom and pop shops, again, a Satosa, Singer, even the Podikade. 13 billion dollars a year. That's quite a lot of money. 
currently out of that 13 billion dollars, you're looking at 30 million dollars, which is essentially into e-commerce, which is very, very small amount. But the big thing is that 30 million dollars is going to become 1.2 billion dollars in the next five years. So again, this is a huge market which is going uh, untapped. This would include pretty much you buying anything from groceries, we sell electronics, to anything like diapers and so on and so forth. Uh, these stats are also important in terms of these numbers, they're always fluctuating. So in Sri Lanka, we have between 4.5 and 5.5 million essentially Facebook accounts. That means around 25% of the Sri Lankan population have access to the online space. Before I came here, as you would know, this is being live streamed, so I had the opportunity to watch some of these things online. So people are having a lot of interactions there. And as you know, before I started Takas, I was in the policy field. And I'm going to say something. Uh, last regime fell because they could not understand social media. They could not um, control it as much as they would have liked. As you know, four or five years ago, there was a traditional, traditional media was, let's say, self-centered or censored by the state. One of the main reasons the government's change was because of social media. There was the ability for uh, the then opposition and the current government to get their message across. Takas is actually a very, very, very small company. The only reason we can compete with the really big boys and get our message across is because of social media. The reason customers can shout at us when we really mess up, or customers can give us positive feedback is also because of social media. The, all of you guys with your smartphones, with my smartphone, we are interacting with social media. So that number will only increase. And I think that's essentially a very good sign for things to come. This is a little bit about our team. Uh, just to give you one, one anecdotal story. You know, in Sri Lanka, there is this story, and not Sri Lanka, generally there are stories about how companies are built by one person. That's not wholly true. Behind Takas, obviously, there is a guy called Kaling Atulat Mudu, who is a CTO, two of my co-founders, Muttasa Musaji and Dilendra Vibrasekar, and a host of other people. When you go out to the world, you'll obviously be a part of a team, either as leaders or as groups. So remember that. One of the key things about entrepreneurship or doing a job or doing anything really is building, uh, building something as a team. Uh, that would be true about our families as well. They're generally a father or a mother, or if it's even single parents, they build it with a team. No difference from essentially uh, as a company. Uh, the last slide on this is essentially showing what Takas wants to do and what people need to do. So one of our big things is we started as a two-man team. That's two. And we started with very little money in retail. Retail is one of the toughest games in the business. But by 2021, we want to be the biggest player in retail, uh, taking a big part of that pie. That's called having a single-minded goal. So when you build teams as well, please remember that. Now a little bit of thoughts on entrepreneurship. Can I have, uh, again, hands up to think who wants to start their own businesses here? A good number, so Sri Lanka's future looks bright. The good news for the guys who didn't put their hand up, till I was 29, I did not want to start a business. My father was a businessman. I didn't, it didn't look so sound for him, so I was like, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, so you know, anybody can change, change, change tracks, right? Uh, first thing, uh, that's me in the middle. In 2012, that's what I thought uh, what entrepreneurship was like. A Rolls Royce or a Mercedes, I guess, in Sri Lanka's thing, and a private jet. You know, that, that's what I thought when I, when I was 2012 two-man team. This is what I thought I will be end up doing. You know, early success, you know, unicorns, you hear about it. You know, everybody high-fives one another at startup conferences, you know. Uh, none of this is true. It's a big, in, in my world, a mithyavak or a myth. That's what we portray to the outside world. That's a lot of what the world wants to see. That's what people celebrate. People don't actually celebrate anything other than this. Because nobody looks to see somebody sad on Instagram, right? Nobody wants to know how sucky it is at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're coding something. People want to see some you coding on a beach. You know, life is good, you're your own person. So if you get into the entrepreneurship bandwagon, please remember, this may come, 
but this is not it, right? It's essentially a byproduct of what you do. So don't get into any kind of entrepreneurship brand wagon thinking, you're going to be the next unicorn, you're going to be the bee's knees, people are going to love you forever. All, all BS is a nice way of putting it. Let's say, what is entre entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is self-belief. <clears throat> Nobody is going to believe in your ideas more than yourself. Don't look for validation from somewhere else, your parents, your lovers, or anything else, your co Because at the end of the day, when chips are down, the only person who has to believe in your ideas in terms of execution has to be you. So look for that self-belief, and if you believe in the yourself, I think no mountain is insurmountable. Uh, the other one is perseverance. So this is something which is told. I think most entrepreneurs will tell you. Perseverance is key. Because like in entrepreneurship, in order to get things done, sometimes you get lucky early. Sometimes you get lucky later on in life. I'll give you two examples. Uh, most people wear Nike shoes, right? It's a well-known brand. Nike shoes, when they started their operations, were making, making pretty cool shoes. But nobody was really wearing them in America because nobody was running at the time. Running, you know, like you see at Vihara Mahadevi Park or your garden was a huge alien concept. So when people started running in America because they thought it was healthy, in the 70s, Nike picked up. If nobody started running, Nike wouldn't have picked up. Airbnb. Airbnb started with the idea of, of course, sharing, opening your house to other people. Nobody was using it for a long time. Then the recession happened in America. Then what happened? Airbnb exploded. That wouldn't have happened if any of those guys started giving up early. And that's why we don't also give up. When I started Takas in 2012, um, it was a very kind of hard journey, and to this day, it is a very, very hard journey. So I'm just telling you that. Because a lot of people will obviously say, you know, you're doing a great job, you're changing the way people buy things in Sri Lanka. Absolutely true. But as you can see, even in this hall, only a very small amount of people have bought online. So the journey is long and hard. But if you persevere, the chances are that you will succeed insurmountably increases. So not giving up is essentially one of the key qualities, I think, of making a great entrepreneur. The other one, which I've accounted, don't be naive. People say sometimes, some, some investors have said, you know, you need to have this killer instinct. You know, just crush them. Or they will say stuff like, um, where people will say stuff like, can't be soft. This is not true again. Now, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you have to look around you and help people around you. No matter how busy you are in life, people who help, around, help other people tend to succeed a lot more in the long term. Um, good example, which you guys all might know about, Uber versus Lyft. Uber was known to be a very strong company. Alpha males did a lot of bad things. Now they are essentially paying the price for it. They built a culture of succeeding at any cost. And now what has happened to them? You know, their CEO had to leave, there's huge structural changes. Lyft was built, Lyft built essentially the same product, but they said something completely different. They said, you know, we are going to be nice towards our drivers. We are going to be nice towards, um, you know, the employees work for us. And they have built a substantially different country, uh, business. If you speak to most successful entrepreneurs who have done it by themselves, like Steve Jobs, they would say the only reason they succeeded was because people were nice to them. And then they have repaid that debt to everybody else. So my message to you guys is um, be trusting of others. There's only always only a few bad apples in society. You have to help one another because by helping one another, you can get further. Uh, to in, for instance, at Takas, I mean, it's no big secret, I think I see a few familiar faces here. I don't have any technology insights whatsoever. If I was insecure about this thing, I wouldn't have been able to build a top-notch technology team. I asked for help. People helped me. And because of that, we managed to build a technology team. And we managed to compete with the best. 
So please remember to help others in what you're doing. The other one, reinventing oneself. Don't stick to traditional stuff. Always be in a constant form of change. Be ready to change. That even might be little things, like your freaking workout routine or the lack thereof. Uh, maybe it's, it's essentially learning a new language to code. Or essentially, it might be making a new bunch of friends. It might be traveling. The ones who are exposed to change and open to newer ideas will flourish. Now, I'll give you another example of it, which is very pertinent. Sri Lanka has a really big problem of looking insular. When you look at California, at that technological marvel which is happening, when you look at the faces, there are lots of different colors there. You know, brown, black, yellowish, or whatever you might call it, purple. People from different areas in the world have come there, and the best people kind of cluster together. We should not be insular looking when we are looking at building companies, building a country. So what I'm trying to tell you is, this country is not for one, one nationality, certainly. Certainly not for one idea. If we think like that in the 21st century, we will get squashed by the people who are more open uh, to new ideas, people, and so on and so forth. So innovation will definitely come when we have better ideas. So what I'm trying to say is don't be insecure. Go essentially embrace change. Next one. These are my two cats. Anybody have cats here? Uh, one hand, excellent, brilliant. Two, three, excellent. So I guess most people are dog people, but this is not really about cats. <laughs> but essentially, there are two cats, uh, they both died. So one's name is uh, Custard, that one, and this is uh, Cookies. So Cookies and Custard taught me two of the most valuable lessons in life. One was Cookies always taught me about persistence. Now, as I mentioned, if anybody has a cat, they always beg for food. No matter how much they've eaten, they'll beg for food. Have you noticed this? You can feed them a lot, but they're really doing their thing, day in and day out, morning, night. Sometimes you feel kind of like, you know what? I feel, you know, I feel really good about myself, and I feed that cat one more time. So I want to be that cat. I am that cat when I go to investors, because when I ask money from investors, usually they're like, ah, you know what? <laughs> I don't want to give it to you. But if I take that and don't try with the same kind of heart every single time, I'll fail, you know? Uh, Custard died way before his time, but he taught me a very, very good lesson. It taught me more than anything in the world at a relatively young age that sometimes I'm powerless to do anything. Because I think when we are again in our entrepreneurial bandwagon, you and I know people will always come and say, man, you, you guys are super great. Your friends will say, nothing is impossible. No matter how dark the, the night is, there's always light. Well, you know what? Sometimes it's just dark. <laughs> you need to realize that. You need to realize that in the great scheme of stuff, we are just human, you know, not miracle workers. And that is sometimes a matter of strength. So you will value the things which you hold most dear. If you're running after money uh, and fame and X, Y, and Z, none of that is going to save you or save something else which you really love when you're most powerless to do so. So my, my kind of advice on this one is, Please get your priorities right and spend that time with the people or things you love. Because that, no matter how much money you have someday, how much of fame you have, you will never get back. Because I think when you get into this entrepreneurial bandwagon, as I mentioned before, it's not going to happen in a year. You're going to spend 10, 15, 20 years of your lives building really great companies. And if you don't remember that, uh, you know, you're, you're going to lose a lot of valuable things. And this brings me to one of my last points, which is, if you really look at overnight success closely, it takes a long time, which is what I essentially mentioned to you before. So please don't get into this, this, um, this journey thinking it's going to be a short one. If you think it's going to be a short one, it will inevitably be a long one. So mentally preparing yourself for building great companies is paramount in building a great company. 
because then you can manage the expectations of yourself and your team around. So essentially what I'm saying is, if you're building a startup and you say, you know what, in two years time I'm going to make you all rich, you're probably lying to them and yourself. But if you say, you know, we are going to build a quality product which is going to change how people think, how people act in this country, how maybe help people, that's something which is going to live for a little bit longer. This is the last photograph I have, which I'm going to leave you guys with. Everybody here have some means. Some might have more, some might have less. This is a photograph of an orphan in Austria after World War II, have lost everything, got these two shoes, and this was captured by a photographer at the, you know, um, from Life magazine, which was a big magazine at the time. Why I like it, and I actually have it on my desktop, is when things get pretty dark, you sometimes think, you know, the world is against you, I'm having such a crappy day, why is it just me? The chances are that's not true. The, you are surrounded by people who have a lot less. So be very thankful for what you guys have when you're building stuff. Because I can look around and I know people here has potential, have access, um, you know, has smarts. So remember those things and I think these are the things which you want to bring into the entrepreneurial bandwagon. And if you have that, your chances of succeeding is better, but most importantly, you being happy during that time is much, much better. You don't want to be a miserable boss anyways, right? And we met all one or two of those. So thank you so much. I wish you guys the very best in whatever you do, and I know Sri Lanka is in good hands. Thank you. Bye. Talking very effectively to the entrepreneur in you. We say a big thank you to Mr. Lahiru Patmalad, the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Takas.LK. We'd like to now invite on stage Mr. Namal Ratnayaka, Senior General Manager, Human Resources, Legal and Regulatory Affairs for Mobitel, who will now present a token of appreciation to Mr. Lahiru Patmalad. Can we once again welcome on stage Ms. Lahiru Patmalar to accept this token of appreciation from Mobitel. And we say thank you to Mr. Ratnayaka, thank you very much. Moving on, we have now come to the next presentation. Now the next presentation ladies and gentlemen is uh, on human experience or the HEX model. And that will be covered by Marlin Jayakodi. Well, Marlin is a user experience architect at 99X Technology with close to a decade of experience in the ICT industry, who is recognized for his work both locally as well as internationally. He specialized in enterprise level software product design, which deals across multiple domains such as banking and finance, education, enterprise resource planning, aviation, trading, and many others. Identified as a leader who empowers UX teams and building a UX culture with, within organizations. He actively strives towards evangelizing his knowledge on user experience and sharing his experience with professionals through human experience organization. Marlin currently holds a master's degree in business psychology from Harriet Ward University, United Kingdom. He's also an active member of the Interaction Design Foundation. He has the expertise in quantitative and qualitative user research, cognitive and behavioral science, creating unified user experience, interaction design and branding as well. Can we please welcome on stage? User Experience Architect at 99X Technology, Marlin Jayakodi. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Google I.O. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we are, actually I'm here to talk about how to use the human experience model which we actually came up with, but I want to uh, give you some ideas about how to actually design a software product. 
So designing software products has been there since dog ages, but we tend to do it a bit differently. So uh, just to give you some uh, a small uh, information about uh, human psychology. So uh, there was a, a study which was conducted by Microsoft in 2015. Uh, they say that uh, human attention is limited to just eight seconds, which is uh, kind of a bit disgraceful because uh, we as humans, uh, we are sort of in par with uh, goldfish. So it says that uh, the attention span of a goldfish is also too similar to ours. So uh, if you can't pay attention to what I'm going to talk to you guys next, so don't worry about it because you guys are built that way, so that's your factory default. And uh, it doesn't matter. So if, even if you don't uh, pay attention at your lectures, don't worry, uh, you'll probably end up in a better place than me. So uh, how to respond to this? How to respond for our uh, limitations? So we are built with limitations. That's what makes us human. So to design for these limitations, this is where user experience comes in. So if you want to sort of get into the user experience uh, way of doing things, or user experience design, only you have to think about only three things. If you do these three things right, basically you will be OK with user experience. So the first thing is user needs. It's built into the terminology itself. So you have to think about what are the user needs and the goals. Second is the business needs or the business goals. So it doesn't matter if even if your users are happy if you're not making a buck, right? We are not running charity services. So you also need to think about the business goals as well. Even if you do all these two things, if the technology can't support this solution, you are going to be in trouble, right? So all these three things you have to consider when creating a user experience solution. So uh, this would be basically my uh, mantra for today, if you uh, would say the UX mantra for the day. Uh, it's sadly, uh, we have found out that throughout uh, interviews that we, we talk to a lot of uh, people who comes out from campuses. So we ask them, what is user experience? And they say, uh, likewise. So uh, what I want you guys to take out from today's this particular session is UI is not equal to UX. UX is not equal to UI. A small example. Uh, you go to Facebook every morning, right? Even if you like, you know, just get out from the bed itself, you know, get your mobile and you try to go into Facebook, right? Uh, so you don't use Facebook for the fancy UI, right? It doesn't have the world's best UI. But it has the best user experience. It has one of the best user experiences that I've seen. The user experience itself has more to contribute towards the emotional feeling that you're going to get by using a product rather than anything else. So, uh, when you sort of dig up one of your friend's old pictures these days and do random comments, right? So that's the trend these days. You, it sort of gets you a smile on your face, right? Okay, you put all the random stuff which is there, right? So that's the emotion that you get by using Facebook. So this emotional factor is what we should strive towards when creating good user experience, not just the UI, not just the buttons, not just the icons. So uh, I'm part of this amazing team called Team Hex, and uh, we have been uh, conducting uh, user experience workshops and educational-wise things, seminars and all that, because we found that uh, in Sri Lanka, there's, a, there's lack of uh, ways to get to know about user experience. So me, myself, we, I actually got some ideas from the community, from reading books and through my degrees and my educational qualifications as well, but there's no actual place for you to go and learn user experience or learn about these things. So we found that there was an issue here and we started sort of communicating towards that. And uh, while doing this, uh, we actually 
sort of came across another problem, saying that, what is the process that we are going to use? So we started from using the lean UX process. If you guys have uh, heard about this, uh, we started using that. And also, then we started uh, using the uh, human-centered design process, which was uh, uh, used by uh, a lot of campuses, uh, mainly the Stanford University. And also, we started using the IBM process as well. So there was pros and cons in, uh, cons in both of uh, these processes. So what we did was we came up with the cons or uh, the pros of these processes, and we came up with the human experience model. So this model sort of contains a lot of good things from different, different processes, and we call this it's our process itself. So it looks a bit scary. Uh, it looks a bit complicated than you might actually uh, feel like this. So don't be scared. This is not a lecture. So uh, let's dig into these things. So this is one of the products that we did by using the human experience model. Uh, we came up with some uh, designs. I have some problem with the ticker. Yeah. So we came up with some screens like this. So this completes the sort of the product that we did. And uh, so basically, when you try to do user experience, user experience is like it's like creating uh, your own story. So when you are creating a design for a product, it's basically like you are creating a story. So a story has characters. The story has uh, what the characters do inside the story itself. And each of these characters has different goals. right? So it's the same thing when it comes to creating a user experience strategy or creating a design for a product. So I think uh, you guys must know this uh, television series, which is one of the best uh, stories which has ever told uh, in the recent past. So when you start going through this teledrama, or the TV series we may call, uh, you get to know who these characters are from the few minutes, the first few minutes itself. You know, who's the guy who's honest, you know, who's the guy who's cunning, and you tend to get to know about how these people sort of interact with these other people. So in user experience uh, terminology, we call it personas. So why we need personas is we have to understand who are your user groups. If you know who, you, who your user groups are, then you can design for them and then you can design for the best user experience of them. So we did uh, personas like this, uh, and this should not take that much of time. So maximum time that we take to create the personas is about one hour. Because you just need to get some assumptions straight on, and these assumptions may work, it may work not. So, but the important thing is you have to empathize on the people that you are going to design the product towards, and you have to identify what are the goals, the pain points and the behaviors of these people. So as a rule of thumb, what we say is if you want to design for a product, you have to identify about at least 80% of your user, user group. So you have to cater towards that 80%. But because you can't actually satisfy everyone in this world, and you can't design for everyone as well. So this is why we sort of gather or we create personas. So this is another persona that we created for a, a particular product. Then we come to the journey mapping. So if you remember this telegram exactly, so this guy, he creates an application him himself. And he draws the whole journey of the user on the, on the wall itself. I think this is the best example for a user journey when it comes from UX perspectives. So what happens in a user journey is basically you try to understand what are the each and every steps that the user would take to achieve their goals. So here you can say whether they'll be using uh, a mobile phone to connect to your system or whether they'll log into the system, likewise. So the each and every step in the process, you just have to uh, take it down and create a small document. Uh, to be very honest, this is the only document that you need to develop your application. Because each and every information of these steps, the pages, the flows, so we call it channels and uh, touch points. Touch points and channels are basically uh, how the person will interact with your system. So uh, when creating a journey map, you can define different uh, statuses or different processes in your project. 
and you can see what are the levels and what are the things that the user should do to achieve their goals. This uh, a simple journey map that we created for one of our products. And the most important thing, and the thing that we normally don't do, is user testing. So when you're creating a UX strategy, or when you're creating a, thinking about how to sort of design a product, you have to always think that how are you going to test this as well? How are you going to test your interfaces? How are you going to test your design with your users? So there are many ways to do it. Uh, so the two main ways that we follow at Hex is basically one is uh, qualitative design, the other one is quantitative design. So when you talk about qualitative design, it's basically you talk to your users. So you talk to your users in, and you ask whether you like this, whether you like what you see, and how, how does it make you feel likewise. So it's about uh, verbal feedback, what your users are giving you. The quantitative side is basically you have to identify what are the matrices and what are the things that they will actually identify as which is measurable. So quantitative will have separate matrices like task on time and uh, appreciation on uh, sections as well. Yeah, so after that, uh, we come into actual uh, sketching of the application. So uh, what we do normally is we do uh, something, uh, an exercise called design sprint, uh, which is actually invented by the Google Ventures. So what they do is they take five days to come up with a, a prototype uh, or a testable solution. So we tend to do this in about two days, where we get all the people who are sort of in the product team, or in the project team, and we ask them to come into one room, and uh, we ask them to sketch all the ideas that they have towards uh, creating the product. So uh, after sketching these ideas, we ask them to vote on the best ideas, and so that we can actually identify what are the best ideas which we can use in the product design. So what happens in this exercise is basically they feel really included. All the project team members feel included that they feel happy that, OK, my design is represented inside this product. And, uh, and there are some other things as well. So as Sri Lankans, we tend to uh, not talk much in uh, our innovation meetings. There are some people who just talk a lot. And there are like the silent bunch as well. So in a design sprint, what happens is the people who are silent, the people who doesn't actually contribute to the conversations, they also have to sketch. So these kind of ideas actually get highlighted in your product design. These are uh, the kind of uh, sketching wireframes that we come up with after a uh, design sprint. So we, what we do is we hang all these things around the walls, and we ask them, each and every one, to vote on the best ideas. So these are some of the really ugly sketches that I have done. And uh, also, you can digitize these wireframes as well, but this is not a must. If you can get your ideas conveyed across to your team, that will be more than enough. But this would also help you to sort of uh, convey ideas better in a very clean way. And you can actually identify what is your information architecture or the, information, or the hierarchy of the information as well. OK, so uh, the final step of the process will actually be uh, designing the visual designs. So you got the wireframes done. And uh, you, after that, you have to do the visual designs or the, the, the product design itself. So what we normally believe is that UX design in 2018 is not about designing pages. It's more about designing components. So if you guys are familiar with uh, front-end architectures like uh, Angular or React. So these kind of platforms, they support a lot of uh, uh, support a feature called components. Are you guys familiar with uh, what is called components? Right. So uh, when you sort of uh, try to design components, you get to identify what are the components inside the application, right? So to do this, uh, there's this uh, method called atomic design. So I have put the QR code. If you guys want to take this down, there's a free uh, available uh, ebook, so you can sort of read about, uh, read more about it. So, <coughs> atomic design is basically uh, built on atoms. So atoms are the 
the miniature structures or the most small element in your design. This may be icons, small buttons, or a certain set of text. Uh, a set of atoms will create molecules. So molecules will be basically be like an input box or input group. If you guys are, are uh, sort of familiar with Bootstrap, so they have sort of groups of these small elements. And then you create organisms. So these organisms are basically the ones are more closer to an angular component. So you can derive it like this. So you have the atoms first. Atoms are basically the smallest UI components that you have. And then you have the molecules, which you can create by grouping atoms. And you have the organisms. So the organisms are basically are individually functional. So when you think in these perspectives, your developers won't take that much of time to develop these components and test it out as well. If you test out different separate components, then you will have a testable product at the end, which you won't have to spend a lot of time testing the product in the end of the day as well. So after creating organisms, after creating organisms, uh, then you can go towards creating templates, which will be sort of default uh, uh, placeholders for your data. And the pages actually will be developed throughout that, which will hold the actual data. So um, another small tip that I would like to create, uh, to give you, is to create and distribute design systems. So when you create a, a product design, there will be a lot of components that you are using by using atomic design or any other design pattern that you may be, that you are following. So when creating a, a design system, what you can do is you can uh, collaborate with your design or, or design team or your development team, and you can share your ideas with your team as well. So what we normally do is uh, we create a Google slide, a set of slides containing all these components. So you can go towards any of the, uh, the hierarchy of the elements of these. So uh, you can categorize these into like uh, convincible uh, sections. So what I have done here is I have put the colors in one section where you have the spot colors, with the hex values and all that. And uh, you have the gradients. After that, uh, you have the global components which will be used across your application. And uh, then you have the navigation bars, how you sort of define the navigation in this whole application. Uh, the typography, how you're go going to use the headlines, the body type, likewise and how you create the forms likewise. So creating design systems would actually cater towards to create the consistency throughout your application. So this is uh, basically a video uh, of the product that we did. So this was basically a, a product which was uh, mainly uh, catering towards uh, trading. So it's an tra online trading application. And uh, this was mainly, follow, we followed the whole uh, entire hex model to sort of come up with uh, the prototype for this. The clicks that you see here is used by InVision. So we, what we did was we did the whole design and we uploaded it in InVision. And uh, we created a clickable prototype so that we can do the user testing later. So each and every process that you see here is testable. And we got the, uh, uh, the feedback from our uh, client saying that, OK, this is all fine. So uh, as a final note, uh, these are the tools that we normally use. So we get a lot of, uh, I see people clicking photos as well. So we get a lot of uh, in, uh, uh, questions regarding the tools. So uh, what happens with the tools is if you get uh, very limited to the tools that you have, and if you're thinking sort of diverts towards only the tools that you are using, then you will come across a lot of problems when sort of when the uh, technology sort of overgrows. So uh, we use uh, Draw.io for uh, creating journey maps and uh, uh, flowcharts. It's a it's a free online tool. Uh, it's, you can use it with uh, Google uh, Drive. And it's, it's fairly uh, simple, and it's very easy to use. Uh, we use InVision for um, uploading uh, design and sort of maintaining design uh, versions. Also, uh, it supports uh, clickable prototypes. And uh, it sort of supports the development handoffs as well. So one of the best features in InVision that we actually found out was you can upload the visual designs to InVision. 
and then you can sort of derive the HTML and the CSS codes from InVision itself. So this will sort of uh, speed up your front-end development process as well. Uh, the next one is Sketch. Sketch is sort of something like Photoshop. If you guys are uh, familiar with Sketch, it's sort of like uh, Photoshop, but the pro only problem is it only works on Apple. So if you have a Macintosh uh, or a Mac, uh, Sketch would be the best uh, tool to sort of go towards uh, doing visual design. And it has a lot of features like uh, the component-based uh, based elements, and you can drag and drop elements. You can maintain uh, design systems inside Sketch itself. Uh, Photoshop, you all, all, all of you guys know. Uh, we only use Photoshop for image manipulation. We don't actually use Photoshop for a lot of uh, web designing processes. Uh, thirdly, Balsamic uh, is a really good uh, uh, wireframing tool. So all the wireframes that you saw earlier, it was done through Balsamic. Uh, the beauty of Balsamic is basically how you can drag and drop details, you can drag and drop uh, uh, elements just then and there, and you can actually create a, a basic wireframe in a, in a very small amount of time. Uh, finally, uh, we have the Hotjar. Hotjar is basically used for user behavior analysis. So what happens normally is after you uh, release a product, after you do something like uh, a website, you have to put, out, put it out. And after that, uh, you have to see what are the users are doing inside your website. So you have to get analytics of whether people are viewing the screens, whether people are clicking buttons, and you have to record user sessions as well. So this is where Hotjar comes in, and it's, it sort of helps us a lot in creating um, or analyzing, getting the data, and showing it to our clients, and sort of proving the design decisions that we have taken, and how these design decisions have actually played around in the practical sense. So. Uh, that sort of concludes uh, the session. Thanks for tolerating. Thanks. Bye-bye. We will now be presenting a token of appreciation to Marlin. And before that, uh, we need to highlight the fact that uh, the Google I.O. extended uh, 2018 in Sri Lanka is uh, powered by Mobitel. And in fact, it is the Mobitel Innovation Center. Now, uh, the Mobitel Innovation Center comes under the enterprise business. Uh, arm of uh, Mobitel and uh, we would like to very warmly invite the gentleman who leads the enterprise business of Mobitel, General Manager Enterprise Business Mobitel, Mr. Prabhat Gamage on stage. Let's put our hands together and welcome on stage Mr. Prabhat Gamage who will present a token of appreciation to Marlin Jakodi, our presenter who uh, had a very interesting presentation on the human experience model. Thank you Marlin, thank you very much. Are you a pudi and a madi? Come on, come on. <laughs>